of the European banking system. Um, if you see the screen, you will see that we have had some technical difficulties this morning. Uh, one of our panelists has not been able to connect yet. And Jose Manuel Campa, who will be the one who actually will be speaking first. Uh, you will not be able to see him, but at least to hear him. And Elena Carletti is uh, the only one which is uh, live present. And uh, now we have also Rim Mayadi, who can also join us uh, live and in picture uh, from Barcelona, I believe. Uh, many thanks for all of you to join us. Um, by talking uh, just a couple of minutes here before the meeting started, uh, I shared my view that actually the state of the European banking system is perhaps better or at least less bad <clears throat> than many people feared uh, when the crisis really broke. Um, so far, banks seem to be weak, but rather stable in, the, in their weakness. Now, we all know that in a certain sense, the worst is yet to come. Um, how many firms will go bankrupt, not be able to service their debt? Nobody knows. Um, how will supervisors and regulators react uh, when some of these losses become apparent? Again, uh, this is all in the open. And to discuss these questions, we have uh, the perfect uh, panel this morning, starting with Jose Manuel Camper, who is the chairperson of the European Banking Authority, uh, now no longer in London, but in Paris. Um, and uh, therefore, I would like to give you, Jose Manuel, the first uh, <coughs> to be the first one to speak. If you could give us your impression in five to 10 minutes, and then I will turn to Elena Caletti. Many thanks, Jose Manuel. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, can you hear me okay? We hear you perfectly. Very good. Well, thank you very much, first, for organizing this panel, and second, for inviting me to represent the ABA in the panel. Apologies for not being, for you not being able to see me. Uh, I'll be relatively quick in the five, ten minutes that you've given me. As you said, you know, the crisis at its origins, of course, was a health crisis that has had a large impact on economic activity due to the measures taken to alleviate the health implications of the crisis. And that as a result, it's also potentially affecting the financial sector. But in the short term, at least, you know, uh, we're happy to, to see that both uh, the ability of, of banks, but particularly financial sector in general, to operate in this new virtual environment was robust. Operational resilience was high. And at the same time, also financial infrastructure in general was also able to, to deal properly with moments which uh, particularly uh, in the midst of, of the middle of March and April were of very high volatility at least and, and potential tension. Uh, policies that have been put in place have been also, I would say, uh, quick and assertive, both from the monetary and from the fiscal policy side. Uh, we can argue about, about whether we like them more or less, but overall I think they've been assertive. And uh, specifically with the situation of the banking sector, you know, in the short term, the concern, as I say, and the focus was on operational resilience and making sure that we're able to continue to provide basic infrastructure services and also to support their customers in what looked to be early on, obviously, a large potential uh, liquidity need, restructuring of lending obligations and putting in place other policies that, that will facilitate the effectiveness of some of the measures being put by governments, particularly in links to moratorium and public guarantees. And that has been a big chunk of the work that the banks have done. I think in that sense, they have contributed to, to at least not be a, pro, a pro cyclical aspect of the, of the transmission channel, but rather a relatively counter cyclical aspect and dampen a little bit the implications of the short term, at least the short term implications of the crisis. Our assessment, you know, was that the initial position of the banks was strong, from a, particularly from a capital and a liquidity position. On the capital level, the average core equity tier one ratio of the industry was 14.9%. That meant that banks had a management buffer, i.e. a level of capital above capital requirements that was approximately of 300 basis points. On top of that, the decisions that were taken by authorities in releasing some of the capital buffers and also by banks uh, at, at the encouragement of the authorities, I must say, you know, 
to to retain dividends and not some other other some other capital payout exercises that also contribute another hundred basis points. If on top of that we add also the average P2G that banks have in the European Union, which is basically another hundred basis points, and that's there also to be used, that gives a buffer of about five hundred basis points in capital, you know, to basically uh, absorb potential losses that may come from the from from the crisis into the banking sector, and also as well, you know, to provide obviously increases in balance sheet to increase lending is as needed as needed in, in different sectors of the economy. I think banks have been responding in that way. Early on, of course, the, em the emphasis has been providing liquidity and potential increase in balance sheet. As we move through the crisis, you know, some, some losses may start to arise in the banking sector. So as we think about going forward, you know, uh, uh, what's the situation of the banks now and what will likely be going forward? As I said, the starting position was good. Uh, as we go forward, you know, there are, there are two different areas of, of concern from our perception. One is the crisis itself and the implications of the crisis. And here I would like to point out to two different dimensions. One is that, of course, we have a very large amount of uncertainty about how the crisis will evolve over time, and particularly, you know, how the economic cycle, whether we're going into a, a a relatively fast recovery phase or a much, much more a slower recovery phase or even a second wave of health problems that may have a second wave also of economic implications. And that's uncertain and that's very difficult to assess at this point. So banks need to prepare for that situation. The second aspect is that as many of these policies that have been put in place to alleviate some of the consequences of the crisis are, the, are, are being developed and, and implemented, many of them in their nature are, are of a national nature and they're diverse. They're diverse depending on the specificities of the national policy that was put in place, but also depending, depending on the counterparties they're addressing, where they're addressing, you know, uh, unemployed citizens, citizens overall, low-income citizens, uh, mortgage holders, or as we go into the corporate sector, SME, sec SME sector or large and medium companies, so that provides a large amount of heterogeneity across the union. And it, for, us, for us, it's important that we keep a close eye on the implementation of those rules to make sure that the single market continues to function properly, to make sure that, you know, the residual losses that go into the banking sector, you know, are reflective of the underlying situation of the banking sector and not just of the, of the effectiveness of those policies at the national level. In that aspect, you know, we would like to see more of you, obviously, of a European coordination. And that's an analysis that needs to be done. And I'm happy to see that the Council in July will put forward European policies in that, in that front. You know? That's one general aspect. The second aspect, which has more to do with the underlying structure of the banking sector and not so much with the crisis itself, is that some of the challenges that we had identified in the banking industry prior to COVID-19, and when I go back to our risk assessments, let's say, as of the end of last year, you know, and I think about what the, the, the risk vulnerabilities that we had identified there, you know, I would say, and to make it very simple, I would say there were around three basic lines. One is a, a challenge on profitability in the banking sector, because, you know, uh, as we know, the return on equity average for the banks of the union was below the cost of equity. And that was a challenge over the medium long term. Now, that challenge of profitability, given the macro environment in which we're confronted going forward, is now gotten better as a consequence of the crisis, but it's actually likely to continue to be uh, challenging. The second aspect was the, the sort of sustainability business model challenge in terms of technological transformation that banks were confronted with, that we can, uh, in a very simplistic way, refer to as the digital transformation that we're engaging in. Well, we know that as a result of the COVID-19 crisis, well, the digital transformation more likely than not will be accelerated. So that challenge now remains and it's likely to be more pressing than before. And the third one was, you know, the, some pockets of excess capacity, lack of, lack of, uh, I would call efficiency in the banking sector, you know, uh, need for restructuring that remains there and it's likely to continue as a result of the crisis. So those challenges remain and they need to be tackled as well at the same time by banks as they, as they continue to uh, maneuver throughout this difficult situation. Let me stop here. You gave me five to 10 minutes, so I don't want to talk much longer. I think I spoke for eight, which is halfway, but I'm happy to engage in any conversation or debate. Um, you'll have right for an additional two minutes later during the discussion. 
Uh, we'll keep that uh, in reserve. Uh, many thanks for this uh, extremely rapid summary, which I take to be uh, quite upbeat. Uh, um, the patient, uh, if I may say so, uh, is stable, although uh, she has some uh, pre-existing conditions, which we know are always likely to uh, intensify the impact of any uh, disease or problem you encounter. Um, let me turn now to Elena Carletti, who is a professor at the University of Bocconi and plays an important role in the European Systemic Risk Board, which uh, I also had the pleasure of uh, being associated with for quite some time. My memory is correct, uh, the ESRB was created actually to warn of future risks, future crises. And now for the second time already, it finds itself in the middle of an ongoing one. And I must say this one was really very difficult to predict. Uh, Elena, how are you coping? Yes, so first of all, good morning to everybody and thank Daniel for inviting me to this, um, to this event. Um, how are we coping at the ESRB is that the, the short answer is that the ESRB, as you can imagine, is very busy and it has also participated actively recently with a recommendation on dividend restrictions for banks. So this was probably the most, the closest, if you want, the work of the ESRB in the context of the banking sector, but not only in the banking sector. But um, so let me go back to what uh, Jose, um, so Jose said. So in a way, I'm not going to disagree with anything of, this, of the things that he said. But let me, be, let me maybe um, restart a little bit uh, and taking back some of the points that he mentioned. And let me divide then my first remarks in three different parts, which is basically what he also did. So first, how were banks at the start of the crisis? Second, what happened during the crisis, and during the crisis means the short term, as Jose Manuel put it. And third, going forward. So what about the medium to long term? So how the European banking se sector was positioned at the beginning of the crisis, I think Jose Manuel put it very nicely. Banks were much stronger capital and liquidity wise, but they had a very weak level of profitability. And that problem still remains and it will be exacerbated. Why were banks in Europe unable to recover relative, for example, to US banks in terms of profitability? The reasons are many, but certainly one is that Europe had an additional crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, in addition to the financial crisis. Fiscal policy responses, in response in particular to the global financial crisis, were much delayed in Europe and much weaker and smaller than in the US, which meant that we had a lower growth for a longer period of time, which led to big increases in NPL. Also, we had in Europe a very low level of interest rates, which is now bound to stay for much longer than before the COVID that we could have expected. And we had a very different level of market structure because the European banking sector is way more fragmented than the American banking sector. These all contributed to low profitability and more than profitability itself, I mean, what contributed to was a very low price to book evaluation. So European banks, with the exception maybe of Nordea and KBC, are way below one, way below the US banks. And why do we care about it? It's not that we care about bank profitability and shareholders themselves, but we care about the ability of banks to be able to raise capital going forward and therefore to be able to withstand the shocks. So the low valuation means that going forward, if banks will have a problem of raising capital, they will have more difficulties than maybe other counterparties in other jurisdictions. So this is why we care mostly about bank profitability, not so much for profitability itself. On, in this situation comes the crisis that, as Daniel said, nobody could have predicted. It was a very exogenous, very massive, very rapid. And here, as a non-policy person, I would like to, to, I mean, to, to somehow express all my um, approval for what the European institutions did, starting with the ECB and the DBA, the SSM, and all the, if you want, a monetary uh, financial institution. We had, for the first time, a very massive response, as also Jose Manuel said, of fiscal policies. But as he said, the fiscal policies were very uncoordinated, I wouldn't say not just in terms of counterparties, but they were very uncoordinated across countries. 
in terms of size of the overall package, uh, in terms of scope, some countries allowed more moratoria, some went more on state guarantees with, as he said, the different counterparties, and this is bound to stay. So this problem of uncoordinated policy response is bound to stay also in the medium to long term, because as he also Jose Manuel said, this is going to lead to a heterogeneous problem in the banking sector as a reaction to this. So this is the, uh, the, the short term. And on top of this, even within, if you want, the single countries, we have seen responses that have varied between responses that were implemented by governments. Now I'm talking about fiscal again. Uh, responses that were implemented by banking associations and responses that have been implemented by individual banks. Why is that important? Because it creates, again, a fragmentation of policies, I mean, heterogeneity, but also because the different policies have different regulatory treatment. So whereas maybe the state measures do not lead to reclassification of loans, measures that may be implemented by individual banks may be subject to reclassification of loans if problems arise. So there is, there, is, there, is, there is a little bit, as he put it, of uncertainty, but there is a little bit, if you want, of confusion of the overall measures that have been taking place. And they always belong to the more fiscal side, if you want, or how to deal with the counterparties of banks. Let me go to the last point, which is the going forward. So if I retake some of the points I mentioned at the very beginning, first of all, we have a problem of weak profitability. This is problem is going to stay, and it's going to stay also because, as I said, the low interest rate environment is bound to stay for much longer than we thought uh, before. Is this good? Is this bad? You know, at the ESRB, many works have been done on the, on the effect of the low interest rate for banks. I would say that right now, Yes, low interest rates still somehow tend to contribute to diminishing the net interest margin and therefore the profitability. But on the other hand, they may be very helpful at the moment for NPL. So they may be very helpful in somehow the short-term effect of the low interest rate, which is reduce the default risk of the companies. So in terms of the borrowers of the banks in general. So in that sense, maybe the positive side of the low interest rate environment are bound to increase going forward relative to how we could assess them just at the beginning of the crisis. But clearly, there is a problem of non-performing loans, which may be coming up in the medium to short term. Remember that any of the um, state guarantee measures that have been put forward are there for, um, for the new loans. But banks, of course, will have eventually a problem on the existing portfolio of loans. This is where we may be seeing non-performing loans coming up again at the end of the moratoria period in particular. Why is this important to distinguish? Well, because here, I think also finding a solution to the new emergence of non-performing loans may be more complicated because in a way we are dealing with the past and then, we, as we know, dealing with the past is always difficult because we are going to rebring in moral hazard issues. Maybe banks had more uh, risky portfolio than others, and we are then confronted with the situation of non-performing loans and the situation that may require more systemic response with all the problem of the, the different uh, behavior of banks before the crisis, which we may reemerge. Um, uh, two other points I would like to say, and then I stop. One is uh, we have seen a big relaxation of the regulatory measures, as uh, Jose uh, Manuel said. One issue I see with this is that at some point we need, I think, for investors, but also for banks themselves, to rebring in a little bit of certainty. So when is it that banks will have to re-comply with capital regulation or liquidity regulation? When is it that we will see regulation become stringent again? Can we give some indication of the time horizon, because this would help banks in preparing themselves for the medium to long term and probably also markets to evaluate the future prospect of banks better. This also holds for the dividend policy. I think it was necessary probably to restrict the dividends at this stage. But I think, again, we don't want to make the European banking sector uninvestable, and therefore we need to contain this policy probably uh, we, with more certainty. Very last word, sovereign debt. I said at the beginning that one of the problems of European banks was the sovereign debt crisis. Here, clearly, the massive respo fiscal responses we have seen in the countries, 
uh, is, are going to increase the, the sovereign indebtedness. There is no doubt about it. So I very much hope that we will not be back in a way in the 2011-13 situation, at least in a few countries, because this, of course, could change the resilience of banks quite substantially. So let me stop here. Thanks a lot, uh, Elena. Um, let me just make one housekeeping appointment. Uh, participants should have a question and answer button on the bottom of their screens where they can uh, put uh, questions uh, to, uh, to our panelists and I will try to see them and then uh, tran transmit them. Um, I cannot resist uh, one comment on fiscal policy and public debt, if you allow me, Rim. <laughs> um, Elena, you said that uh, European banks were weak in part because the European or the fiscal response in Europe, especially in the Eurozone, had been weaker than the United States. And then you concluded by saying, maybe we have uh, too much debt. Now, the advantage of having had a weaker fiscal response to the last crisis was, in my view, that uh, in many countries, we were actually starting with a debt uh, situation, which was comfortable or let's say less bad than it would have been otherwise. So it preserved some room for maneuver for this unforeseen event. And uh, that is, I think, one of the lessons perhaps we should keep that, uh, as somebody said, things happen. And ah, there it is, <laughs> Jose Manuel. Um, and uh, with a low public debt, you're much better prepared to, uh, to react uh, to events. Um, that is perhaps something for the day after. Um, but let me stop here with my considerations uh, on this topic. It's great to have you with us, Rim. Uh, she has had many academic appointments on different continents. But for us, the most important one is, of course, that she is associated as a senior fellow with SEPS. And uh, Rim, therefore, uh, I would like to give the floor to you. Uh Thank you, Daniel. I'm very happy to, uh, to talk to uh, in this webinar. So I will go to my three blocks, in fact. Uh, one is really taking stock about what has been our uh, preliminary assessment uh, from the banking stakeholder uh, group. Uh, and second, the challenges from banks and consumers. I think this is important also to see uh, that, that during this period, a lot of changes, and then obviously these changes were confronted uh, not only by banks, but also uh, from a consumer perspective. And three, some of the proposals that uh, we as uh, BHG have, um, have uh, given in terms of uh, sustainable uh, recovery, where in fact banks could be part of the solution in the recovery uh, process. Now, uh, the first thing, uh, and I completely agree with both um, uh, Jose Manuel and Elena, uh, the diversity and also lack of uniformity of all the relief measures. We've seen it, we observed it. Uh, so all these measures that are adopted uh, by banks, uh, not only they are not uniform in terms of their characteristics, but also conditions of implementation, which largely differ from the different member states. Uh, all those suspension of loan repayment, for example, that affected consumers and other type of moratoria on payment uh, uh, of credit obligations for SMEs and for mortgages, all these accelerated procedures, for example, to provide new loans and relaxation of collateral uh, and also further support to the most affected sectors. Yes, they are all there, but the problem is their characteristics and conditions are not at all the same between member states. And this, we observed it. Now, uh, also in terms of the supervisor recommendation, and I certainly agree with Elena about this, uh, uh, that some uh, banks have mobilized their own contributions to increase lending capacity by foregoing some of the bonuses and not distributing dividends. So this is temporary, and I am not sure all banks have done this. So this is also very important, and we recommended that to uh, ensure that those practices are well informed and collected, assessed, to encourage, in fact, uh, uh, best practices and also transparency and to deal with fragmentation because of this diversity and non-uniformity of application. Now, the second block of my comments is the challenges facing banks and also consumers. Now, you mentioned uncertainty. Regulatory uncertainty is, in fact, uh, there. Uh, 
uh, in terms, for example, of the treatment of moratoria, which might lead to a certain way to supervisory discretion and consumer detriment. So we've seen, we observed in the union that some of the banks that are compounding interest on the capital, and then this overall increases the overall burden on consumers and leads even further to over indebtedness for individuals and also for companies. So in fact, it is important that all these clients are uh, treated uh, similarly. The second point, uh, also it's the fragmentation, you uh, mentioned it um, uh, in this respect, and there is very key point, which is the recognition of public guarantees as a mitigator under CRR. So this is also not yet, uh, you know, clear from, especially from a banking perspective. So what we have recommended, it's more guidance and symmetry to avoid further fragmentation and discretion that would uh, largely undermine monetary transmission and the single market. There are other issues related to the buffer usability. Uh, yes, how to, to absorb uh, shocks, uh, how to deal with the minimum distributable amount, efficacy of that, and how to avoid the market stigma when the buffers don't go be beyond, uh, below sorry, a, an acceptable threshold. So the stigma of uh, the market. Now, there are many constraints, regulatory constraints, which are the MREL, the leverage ratio, the risk-based capital, so of course, within the recovery period, there is a need to have a certain balance approach, which is also important to assess before you know, putting in place. Again, I agree that the MPL has, uh, has, there is an increase. Why? Because simply there is an indebtedness of individual corporates, uh, especially in countries like Italy, Greece, and Spain. Uh, and of course, and how to manage uh, this increase of MPL, uh, or if, in fact, and to ensure that uh, uh, new regulations, in fact, uh, is there to dispose of these new MPAs. And also, you mentioned a certainty in the regulatory calendar, how to go back to normality after the disruptions uh, uh, in the COVID area. So, in fact, what we also recommended here is to have a comprehensive review to make sure that banks continue supporting the real economy in a post-recovery period without furthering the fragmentation and potential credit crunch uh, which can be detrimental to uh, recovery. Now, four pillars that I want to touch upon and uh, I finish there. One is to uh, pay further attention to the business models. Yes, uh, there has been uh, of banks, of course, and to ensure that uh, the, there is an appropriate balance how to, uh, how to allocate uh, the capital where it is needed in the recovery process. So efficient capital allocation in the real economy to, uh, to make sure uh, that the recovery is sustainable and also to maintain uh, the single market. So this is a very key point. Second point uh, for the recovery is also uh, enhance the certainty of use of buffers uh, to withstand shocks, because we do not know what is uh, the recovery process, how it will look like, uh, and then also the process for the replenishment. I think this is important to ensure that banks also are not penalized and stigmatized in the market. Third pillar is the digital finance. So how to enhance uh, the digital uh, finance and make sure that also work is done in terms of dealing with cybersecurity, IML, CFT, and also uh, more work on the stable uh, coins. And four, uh, consider the different uh, types of uh, recovery, so the shapes, uh, and then design policy answers and trying to really find uh, the appropriate answer within this, either a V-shape scenario, so then you know there is a smooth recovery, or it's more deep recession and pot potentially a financial crisis with uh, an MPL surge uh, with a deflationary spir spiral. The role of st stress test is key, and that can be, in fact, used as a tool to inform the recovery uh, process uh, over time. And then since we are talking about recovery, this recovery has to be sustainable and embedded into, uh, into the compliance with ESG uh, factors. These are my comments. Thank you. Daniel. I apologize. Yes, I had <laughs> just noticed. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Rahim. Uh, and everybody for sticking so closely to the time limit. I have now gotten some questions. Uh, and uh, the first one actually has come in two different guises, so to speak. And uh, I would like to, uh, to direct that to Jose Manuel. Um, and then perhaps also Elena. The question is uh, basically, 
banks uh, have now uh, this uh, enlarged capital buffer that you mentioned before. But uh, as somebody uh, from the participants put it, if you are the CFO of a bank, why would you go out and lend more uh, when you have then later to get more capital and it costs you more than you make a return? Jose Manuel, before you answer, can I actually add something else? And that is uh, this tension uh, between uh, what uh, Elena yourself said about the low profitability of banks and what Rim said, the attempts of banks to basically squeeze out more from their customers. Now, do we not have here a conflict between two aims? On the one hand, we would like uh, customers to be protected. On the other hand, we would like banks to make profits. But maybe we can't have both. Um, which one is more important? Jose Manuel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. That's an easy question that you're asking right now. I think that the, the, the key component here to this answer is, you know, banks, and I'm sure they do this, you know, banks think about a client as a relationship. And the client a relationship over the lifetime of that relationship which could be very large if the relationship is very low, or at least over the lifetime of the product that they're offering, if it's more a product-oriented relationship, okay? Now, uh, coming back to your question about why should a bank like CFO use the buffer, the CFO should make decisions that, may, that, that basically provide, provide adequate return on capital to the bank. And that involves uh, putting forward a value proposition to a customer with, with a price, uh, and other conditions uh, relationship that is uh, coherent with the cost of producing that product by the bank to the customer, you know? And that's basically has a capital component, a financing component and an operating component. So the bank needs to work on all those three areas. I mean, on the capital component, as I, as I said before, and I think it's the, the key question here is that, you know, buffer, buffers have been released and the message has been sent there to be used, you know? I understand and I'm very sensitive to the issue that, you know, banks will, are concerned about when will those buffers, if used, need to be recovered and replaced or not recovered, replenished, replenished. And that's a situation which, you know, I think national supervisors need to have clear clarity on where that's going to be. I think that they, they have been so far sending clear messages that, you know, the expectation is that there will be sufficient time and so that is not going to be recovered. Uh, the, the time to recover this is not while the crisis continues, but it should be in some kind of, of upward behavior of the economic cycle when, will, when that will happen. Second, you know, the financing conditions of the bank are very linear. Monetary policies have been there precisely to provide financing conditions for banks that are very attractive so they can transmit that to the economy. And third is operating costs. And their banks also need to do work and I know they're doing in trying to reduce their operating costs to remain competitive so as to put forward a value proposition to the customer that is adequate. So I think that in the short term, you may think that there is this trade-off between, you know, providing a, a stability to customers in the sense of providing financing conditions that are attractive and making profits. But I think that, that thinking about that trade-off in the short term is misleading. The trade-off should be thinking over the, at least over the lifetime of the product that's being offered to the customer. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Elena, on the, on the second or first question, um, which is always a problem, uh, we cannot force the horses to drink, right? We can only put lots of water in front of them in the form of liquidity and low interest rates. But if they refuse to drink, or at least, let's say in the form of banks to transmit the liquidity to their customers, what can we do? No, I think, um, I, I think I, I mean, first of all, let me say on the use of this uh, horse, of this, uh, what we put in front of them. I think banks, as Jose Manuel also said, a little bit have a problem in making use of the relax, relaxed regulation that they are offered. And they are reluctant because of various reasons, because they have uncertainty about when they need to replenish, whether they need to replenish, because if they are loans with state guarantee, I understand the state guarantees, if they are first requests, I mean, these are technical details, but they may not lead to an increase in risk-weighted asset. But even there, banks are a little bit reluctant to maybe sometimes trust the guarantee. There is, I think, a blame game, at least in certain countries, between banks and governments. 
So that all complicates the use of these measures that are in front of banks. And moreover, I mean, if I go back to the to the question that was asked, if I was a CEO, I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't be happy to run a bank with an LCR below 100% because we know what the market reaction can be to a liquidity ratio, maybe below 100%. So this is a problem. Supervision and the regulation are very good in becoming stricter and imposing higher requirements, but they may be less able and less good in relaxing them. So that I think is a problem and is one big uh, lesson that we should take already now from this crisis. Moreover, as you said, the Daniel Banks need to transmit these advantages to customers. And this is also a delicate, but I think how Jose Manuel responded on this sort of balance between profitability on the one end and long term. Elena, we lost you at least uh, yes, partially. Uh, Can you perhaps repeat your last sentence? Yes, I just I saw that my connection was unstable. I'm sorry. I saw that uh, uh, on the one end, I think banks have difficulties in making use of this flexibility for stigma reason, and as also Rimi said, and also because maybe in some cases there is a little bit of a blame game between the state and the banks in providing loans. On the other hand, I think the, it's important that if they make use of this relaxation and what they have now available, they do pass on to the customer, but with the respect, as Jose Manuel was saying, of the balance in terms of profitability in the medium term. We need to make banks able to arrive to an ROE, which is above their cost of capital and become profitable again. Okay, perhaps before I come to a different question, can I just ask both of you, Elena and Jose Manuel, in the end, do you think uh, the reluctance of banks to extend new credits will be a meaningful obstacle to recovery. I, I would say that at this stage, you know, we have no evidence that that's the case. At this stage, the evidence that we have, both in liquidity and actually loan growth, is that the liquidity provision, the liquidity situation of banks at the beginning of the of the year was 150 percent. The average LCR remains the same at the end of the first quarter. So liquidity is, is plentiful and credit lines are growing in the areas in which we expect them to grow in the parts in which they're growing. So at this stage, I would say there's no evidence in that area. Thanks. Elena, do you agree? Well, I agree in terms of, uh, I, I agree that banks have done their best. I do believe that in some situations there may be problem in, in uh, giving loans. I mean, at least a little bit of reluctance from banks because of the blame game with the government. I think this is important. I mean, let me just take an example of Italy. Banks are required to give new loans without assessing the borrowers with the proper underwriting procedure because the state requires that also to speed up the process. On the other hand, there is still an article in the bankruptcy legislation of Italy that says that if banks don't undertake a proper underwriting procedure, they may be actually criminally investigated later on. So and this is a criminal offense. I think this may create problems. So we come back always to the fact that um, we might have many uh, European rules. Uh, in the end, a lot depends on how they are actually detailed in the legal institution environment of member states. But it's a political winliness, right? Because what they should do, I mean, if the government is asking now banks to relax the underwriting procedure, they should also relax the bankruptcy law to allow, bank, to, to allow a, con a coherence. Whereas I think, there is probably not the political willingness to do that. Political will, also the ability of administrations uh, to deal with these yeah. many aspects uh, yeah. at the same uh, time. Let me perhaps uh, shift a bit uh, gear. Uh, so some people are asking whether actually in the end, uh, will we need an asset management company to help mop up the NPLs from the very past and uh, which might be created by, uh, by this uh, crisis. And would that be helpful in consolidating the, uh, the banking sector going forward? Maybe I will start with Rim on this one and also uh, the question of uh, whether the Wirecard uh, scandal in Germany is a reason to uh, strengthen supervision of, uh, of other players at the European level. Um, 
let me first start with the stock of MPL before the COVID crisis. I think there has been a, a decreasing or a declining trend. Uh, a lot has been done on NPL over the, the past years. And we could see that the NPL uh, stock uh, generally in many member states uh, has decreased, still very high in countries like Greece, maybe Cyprus and others. But overall, uh, we are talking about uh, we are talking about a lower uh, stock as we had before. Now, um, in the medium, I would call it from the from the short to the medium run. I think it's important to, as I said in my uh, comment, it's important to look at the different uh, at the different shapes of recovery. So, if there is a surge of MPL, assumingly uh, we're going to deep recession and eventually a financial crisis, then we need to probably uh, be ready with a central uh, solution like what you, the one that you have uh, proposed means the public asset management company at, at Eurozone level. And this has been also um, you know, suggested by the ECB uh, over the past months to prepare uh, to in fact deal with the stock, the new stock of MPL and also to ensure uh, that uh, the situation is uh, dealt with uh, in the future. Now, if the recovery is smooth and uh, uh, you know, we go back to growth, probably uh, the solutions that have been adopted over the past months could, uh, could be sufficient. And on the supervision of uh, payment um, um, system providers? Uh, sorry, the, the, there was a question on whether one should extend supervision also uh, on uh, providers of uh, payment systems like the Wirecard. Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a very important point, in fact, and I, I believe that uh, C, uh, the SEPA, I mean, the PSD should also cover all those players because uh, nowadays uh, the... Um, I think these pay payment providers, they are mushrooming them, and then they should be in a certain way uh, having the same regulation as all other banks that are providing payment services. Okay, Jose Manuel, uh, would you agree with this? Well, may I, yeah, if I just may say something, you know, particularly I think the question was in the context of, of Wirecard, you know, yeah. which so far, obviously the very large news being developed since very, I would say very early to really be assessed was the source of, of, of the real fundamental issue. Maybe I do. I do think we have some legislation already, and regulation in place for payment service providers. As Rim said, you know, it's an area with these large amounts of innovation. It's an area at the same time in which the the, success, the completion of the single market ability to operate across borders is very important to preserve and to maintain because it's a fundamental area I think for integration in the European Union. I think that we need to have proper regulation for payments. You know, but as uh, as many people say in the, in the industry, and I, I think that that's fundamentally right, you know, same activity arising with the same risk will require the same regulation, you know? So, so if, if, the, if, the, if the payments is a payments activity and raises issues of a particular nature, which could be inherently on the, on the, in payments, which could be systemic to the payment industry, or we could be systemic to other parts, because for instance, a bank that's uh, performing that task, that needs to be assessed by the supervisor. But it should be, you know, same activity, if it leads to the same risk, if it's just a pure payments issue, it should be regulated as a payments issue. If it's a payments issue that may re give rise to financial stability concerns for a bank, then it should be also part of the prudential regulation of banks. Uh, many thanks. Of course, uh, you're quite right. This, this scandal, of course, raises many other issues as well, especially of uh, the supervision of the accounting uh, of uh, publicly quoted firms, where there have been uh, some evident lacuna uh, mm -hmm. And again, this brings us to the question, uh, is a system whereby this is done at the mainly at the national level, is that appropriate? Because uh, and I think I can say so. <laughs> um, there's always a tendency to say uh, um, my banks or my companies are, are well supervised, yours are not in the other country. And that's exactly the game, the blame game, which we had in the banking system before we had banking union. And uh, maybe we need something similar uh, um, in, uh, in, in Europe as well, which of course goes beyond the banking system uh, problems that we had just mentioned. What I'm, detecting, what I'm detecting so far is that uh, people are saying, yes, there are problems, but overall 
it's basically no catastrophe and with a bit of goodwill, things will work out. Now, what I have the impression is that uh, we are stuck in Europe in a, uh, I was going to say in a low energy equilibrium, <laughs> um, in a sense that uh, the from the macroeconomic level, uh, we think that uh, negative, uh, very negative interest rates are the appropriate response. Uh, we acknowledge uh, that this has a negative impact on, uh, on banking profitability, but hope basically that it will be overlaid uh, uh, by other factors. But especially if I read the uh, papers uh, by, uh, by Markus Brunnermeyer uh, about the reversal interest rates, uh, the key point for me is there that over time, uh, the balance of the impact of negative and low rates changes. The impact effect uh, in the short term might be positive because it may rate, raise uh, stock prices and make some more lending profitable. But over time, uh, the, the flow of profits is diminished and therefore the impact in the end uh, is negative. So my question is therefore, is there a way out of this uh, low interest, low profitability equilibrium? Jose Manuel said he was hoping that banks would become better, so to speak, uh, uh, reduce costs, uh, make better value provisions. Um, but uh, they haven't done so far, right? What let us believe that they will do so in the future? Of course, one thing which should induce them is competitive pressure. And here I detected somewhat again a, uh, a a problem in the sense that uh, uh, in the US, perhaps banks are making more profits because they have an oligopoly. Um, so basically a tax on consumers, which keeps the bank system healthy. Now in Europe, you seem to have a system which is overbanked, which I think a term which Elena will know. And uh, too much competition could in the end turn out to uh, strength to, to weaken our system. So is it these two elements? Is there too much competition and too low interest rates in Europe to give us a strong enough uh, banking system? And perhaps I go uh, in the reverse order of uh, the beginning. Rim, Elena, and then Jose Manuel, okay? Uh, this is a very uh, dear question to me, in fact, uh, because yes, uh, um... Yes, uh, Europe, Europe uh, banking system is, I agree, overbanked. I think there should be nowadays there is a push toward restructuring and consolidation. That is clear um, because of low interest rates. Of course, uh, this low interest rate will have more implications on certain business models like the retail oriented business models. It means that all those retail business models generally they are small to medium sized banks. Um, probably less efficient uh, than the largest ones, uh, need to look at the data. Uh, clearly, uh, there is a need uh, to consolidate at the medium uh, level of the market and trying really to uh, uh, increase that efficiency, especially cost efficiency to enhance a little bit, uh, uh, you know, the profitability and so on. So, but then there is another uh, way of looking at it. It's many banks are moving into the, their structure of income to fees. It means that they are changing a kind of a the way to look at their own business models in terms of the income structure. And I think this is also to be considered uh, because obviously this will allow them to increase their uh, their sources of uh, of revenue. In any case, if we compare US to uh, to Europe uh, banking sectors, um, we are discussing two types of uh, two types of uh, structures i mean uh, in 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 uh, in the us for example they have the community banks and 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 they if you look at their overall profitability it's higher than uh, than than in europe now in in europe uh, i i i after several years of uh, assessment i think there is a need to uh, start consolidating and restructuring thanks a lot Elena, do you agree that uh, Europe is overbanked and capacity should be reduced by excess? Oh, yes, 
I think uh, I think it is uh, definitely it is over bank. The uh, capacity should be reduced. Now the question is, how do you reduce it? So do you reduce it at the domestic level, or do you reduce it more at the cross border level? And I think before we were thinking that maybe for the small to medium banks there could be scope for domestic consolidation, and for the larger one more cross border. I think evidence tell us that we have not seen a cross border merger since a while now, actually since a long time now. And I think we're not going to see easily cross-border mergers going forward. The reason being that we know in crisis, normally there is a retrenchment within countries relative to before the crisis. So I think the reason why we didn't see cross-border uh, mergers before the COVID crisis will remain there and probably will be exacerbated. So I expect if there is consolidation, I would expect more probably that there is domestic consolidation. And this goes back to your question of competition, because of course, domestic consolidation may actually reduce competition more than cross-border. But I think this is probably where we will be heading. Having said that, I, I, let me go back to the, one of the very first remarks I made. One of the reasons why we see so little consolidation in Europe is because of the low price-to-book ratio. There is a big risk of dilution once for with consolidation, and investors don't appreciate that very much. So this is why it's important to go back to a more profitable banking sector so that we probably have an increase in price to book and we are able to re-engage also in operations, structural operation in this sector. Okay. Jose Manuel, you are the last one. You have the last word. Well, I'll, thank you for giving me the last word. I'm not sure I have really much to add to has been, what has been said. You know, I think that the question whether it's over banking, what I will say is coming back to the analysis I said before. You know, I think that we, many of us agree that the banking industry is in the middle of a technological transformation. And that will imply a shakeout. You know, whether that's consolidation or, or not consolidation, national cross border, that's for the banks and for the industry to develop over time. But that shakeout should come. And I think we need to make sure that the dynamics are there to facilitate that shakeout. And that implies to me, for instance, in terms of the cross-border, we need to make sure that we have an effective single market and that it makes sense to have the cross-border provision of services so that cross-border activity makes sense and therefore there will be cross-border consolidation. In the, from the point of view of you know, transformation, we need to have a resolution regime that works well so that we can facilitate orderly exit for those banks that are less efficient and making sure that that exit does not cause any inst stability issues, financial instability issues. You know, I think we need to have those process of creative, creative destruction working more properly. You know, we make sure that incumbents, we haven't really talked very much about incumbents you know, versus new entrants, but the, the, the incumbents are not the only name, game, name in town, that there'd be room for income for new entrants in certain parts of the industry. Those are parts that need to go forward. You know, and just my last comment relative to your issue of how banks should adjust. I think it's fair to say, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm at this stage, I'm, I'm obviously a micro supervisor, a sector supervisor, but if I were in a bank, I would take interest rates as a, as, a, as a variable that I do not control and that is given to me. And in that environment, I would say that low for longer is clearly the message that's been transmitted to banks. So they should take that as given and they should operate within the, the tools that they can operate with, you know, to try to make sure that they put forward the adequate value proposition, you know, but that's because interest rates are not set for banks. Interest rates are set for macro purposes. And I, I don't, I don't want to argue whether they're the right place or the wrong place, but I think that we should be honest about that. You know, the interest rates are set for macro purposes and that's the right tool, to be honest, to use at the macro level. Thanks a lot. When I listen to, to all of you, I have the impression that almost we were too good at managing the initial phase of the crisis. Maybe a bit more uh, upheaval and the exit of a couple of banks might have had a positive long-term impact on the structure of banking. So that is always a risk. When you intervene in a crisis, you avoid the worst, but in a certain sense, you also conserve the existing structures. And that I feel is uh, now speaking more in general about the European response to this crisis. Um, we have been pretty good in Europe, I think, at avoiding the worst, um, but there has been very little destruction. We don't know how much it, of it would have been creative, uh, but uh, we risk not only in banks, but also in the wider uh, European economy, uh, 
to conserve too much of the pre-existing structures and miss the chance to uh, having had a, a jolt to our system, which prepares us for a more demanding future. So if you allow me to uh, finish on this unorthodox thought, um, I would like to finish now and thank uh, all of your participants. You have been extremely also disciplined in your interventions. Very interesting. Many thanks. And I hope that if we meet again in six months that uh, the crisis will be really behind us. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Osimaria.